you would turn your scriptures to Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 30. This is the gospel pickle through the eye of a needle. Through the eye of a needle. This is a beautiful parable in which Jesus begins to teach in this story, this narrative of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. And he tells this small metaphorical, if you will, parable. There is a song written and performed by the Australian artist currently known as Sia. Many of you may have heard of her. It is called The Eye of the Needle. And in it, she recounts the loss of her lover and how it is seemingly impossible to move on after their separation. And the lyrics of the course are this. You are locked inside my heart. Your melody is an art. I won't let the terror in. I'm stealing time through the eye of the needle. She cannot take the terror of losing her lover, and she uses the biblical passage to say that she is staring into the impossibility of moving beyond her loss, stealing time, if you will, like the impossibility of going through the eye of the needle. But she leaves us there in despair, unfortunately. Her lyrics stop with the implausibility of moving on, and she does not remember the rest of the biblical story With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And this is the message that the world needs today, is that you can keep trying to do it, to do life by yourself. After three divorces, child support, ten jobs, and every drug that you can take, finally that the world may realize that it is impossible by yourself, but with God everything is possible. So today we look through the eye of the needle in Luke chapter 18, 18 through 30. A ruler questioned him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all of these things I have kept from a youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess, distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Verse 23, but when he had heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Peter said, behold, we have left our homes and followed you. And when he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children to For the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come, eternal life. The young ruler comes to Jesus and he wants to do something to receive eternal life. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And there is a cataclysmic, an epic, an insatiable problem from the very start that Jesus knows where the conversation is going. The man was asking to earn an inheritance of eternal life. Perhaps the rich young ruler believes that he knows and knows how the system works. It was certainly the way of the religious system in the first century, much like it would have been in the Catholic Church at the time of the Reformation, where you could pay for and buy people out of purgatory, a place made up by men to make money. Now, uh, let me put it in this context, I guess, in a way. Um, there is a show on the Discovery Channel that my boys and I like to watch, and it's called, we call it The Gold Show. It's, it's, uh, I believe it's called Gold Rush, actually. And in recent years, and probably the past 10, 5 to 10 years, there's been this recent surge in the gold prices per ounce. And uh, so now there's this revival of the gold rush in Alaska, out west, and even in places like South America. And so all these people have moved their families and their 
there uh, mining gold in Alaska. And, you know, I love to watch it because really there's something primal, I think, about dirt and trucks. I don't really know what it is. My kids love to play in the dirt and dig with their trucks, and I love to watch it. You know what I mean? And, 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 and uh, in some ways, you know, I think all of us are like that. You know, these guys are out there playing in the dirt, digging in the dirt. The trucks just got a little bit bigger is all that it is. And they're looking for something. And, you know, we tried to explain to the boys what a miner was and things like that. And, you know, I, I guess it didn't exactly translate because Wesley and William are out digging in the yard and, and they dig a decent sizable hole and they come and they run and grab me and say, Dad, we found a miner in the hole. And I was like, I guess I didn't explain that good enough, you know, and... Uh, you know, I love to play in the dirt. I don't know what about it is. I loved it so much. My mom used to tell me that I would eat the dirt. And, you know, she said she would bring me in the house and she would spank me and tell me not to eat the dirt. I'd go back out, I'd get a stick and I'd scrape it up on the ground and I'd eat it off the stick. I'm like, what? She thought I had a mineral deficiency or something like that. And I was just glad I was using utensils, you know what I mean? And, uh, but you know, this whole show, and it boils down to at the end of every week, they do this big clean out and these massive machines and trommels that shake down the dirt and the rocks and sift out the gold, and then they bring out this tiny little mason jar, and they shake it back and forth, and they're all excited and happy about these few ounces of gold and how many thousands of dollars they made. And sometimes I wonder, I think, if... God looks down at him and he sees this huge operation moving all this dirt. And he's like, gold? A few ounces of gold? I've got so much gold, I paved my streets with it. You know what I mean? Like, like this is a joke, right? You know, the Lord looks at us and he sees our feeble tithes and offerings and all the money and wealth that we think we have and the esteem. And he looks at us and he's like, I own a cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, that blows my mind to think about. I don't even own a hill, let alone a cattle on a thousand hills. I didn't have enough money. I, all I could afford was a lot. And I can't figure that out because it's a little. I don't know why they call it a lot, you know. And, uh, uh, you know, it, the, all of our futile attempts to have these riches and this great strength or a plump or, or, or a fame in our own right is so futile. And the rich young ruler is in this position and he's staring at the man who owns everything in the world. And he thinks that somehow his wealth could purchase something from God. I mean, doesn't that... Don't we see the contrast between the creator of the world and the rich young ruler? Something is deeply flawed in his heart. Trying to buy heavenly things with earthly goods, there's just no exchange rate for that kind of transfer. The young ruler has worked hard for his riches, and his forefathers before him have worked for everything that his family has attained. And he believes that it is by some work or performance that might allow him to attain eternal life also. And he is so very wrong. And Jesus says to him in verse 19, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You're calling me good, but only God should be given that title. But the rich man does not answer. He's confused. And Jesus is ultimately explaining to him, Are you ready to receive the implications of calling me good? Because if you call me good, you're calling me God. And if you call me God... You're calling, that responsibility comes with major implications. And if we see Jesus as God, it will come with major implications in our lives also. The most terrifying thought about God is, is the very fact that He is good. Why is that terrible? If there is a God and that He is good, He does not let evil go unpunished. That's why it's a scary and terrible part of this acknowledgement that He is good and that we are not. We have sinned against everyone and everything, especially God. And if he is then just and will punish evil, then we have to die for our sins. And even if he decided somehow to be merciful and to pardon us sinners, then he is unjust because no one is suffering for our sins. Because the wages of sin is death. Unless, however, 
someone were to suffer in our place. Unless God himself were to provide the way for us to be forgiven. With man it is impossible, but with God it is possible. If Jesus were not God, then it would be impossible for us to be unsaved. If it was only a man, if he was only just some man that came, some great prophet, then we are hopeless. But if Jesus was God, then my sins are no longer mine at all. They were taken away by Jesus and crucified on the cross. Only God could provide the means of forgiveness. This story is recapitulated in Abraham taking his son Isaac to the altar. Remember the story... The Lord tells Abraham to take Isaac, his only son, and sacrifice him. Many theologians, many people believe that he went and he built the sacrifice and laid his son Isaac on the very Mount of Calvary. And as he rose the knife and uh, before he would bring it down to slay his own son, the angel of the Lord stops him. And where does the sacrifice come from? The Lord himself is what Abraham said will provide. And there in the thicket is a ram caught by his horns. And that became the sacrifice on Calvary. It is nothing that man could do. If Isaac were slayed that day and sacrificed to God, it would have done absolutely nothing. But if God provided the sacrifice, then our sins are no more as we receive Jesus into our hearts. Because our sacrifice means nothing to God unless God is the provider of the sacrifice. And Jesus says to the man after listening to all the moral uh, law of the Jews, One thing you still lack. Sell all of your possessions and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now this seems like three different things. Sell everything, give it away, and follow me. But it's actually one thing. It's all following Jesus. Following Jesus means forsaking everything else, leaving it all behind. Following Jesus is the climax of the requirement of eternal life. Despite his highly self-righteous claims, the rich young ruler, his obedience to the Mosaic law, it does not compare to following Jesus. One thing he lacked. G. Campbell Morgan tells a story about preaching in this great church. Beautiful church, all elementally oriented and uh, uh, ordained with all the beautiful things. Big pipe organ with reeds and everything that was necessary to to administer the beautiful music in the hymns. And it was common for the day that as a guest minister came in, that he would choose a song that was commensurate with the sermon, and he would call out the hymn, and everybody knew everything so well, and the words, and uh, they would begin playing the hymn on the pipe organ, and then everybody would stand and begin to sing. So G. Campbell Morgan goes to the pulpit, calls out the hymn forward, and there the uh, pipe organ player begins to play, and G. Campbell Morgan sits down next to the pastor as they begin to sing the song, and he says, man, what is wrong with that pipe organ? It sounds terrible. The pastor leans over and he says, there's nothing wrong with the pipe organ. He said, we don't have anybody that knows how to play it. (laughs) One thing you lack I mean, you can have everything else right. You can give to the poor. You can have the big organ. You can have the nice church, you know. But if you don't have anybody to sit down and play the correct notes, it means nothing. You can give to the poor. You can be moral. You can do all the things right. You can go to church and look nice, buy all your clothes at the mall, put perfume on, smell good for cologne, you know, work hard. And yet, if you're not following Jesus, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. If we're not following Jesus, there's no other way. Do you remember the story of Mary and Martha? It's really a powerful story. It uses the same wordage as Jesus used to the rich young ruler. One thing you lack is the idea. And remember Mary and Martha, their brother is Lazarus, and Jesus goes to their home to eat. Remember, table fellowship is huge in the first century, especially among Jesus. Everywhere he goes, he's eating. And uh, that's why Christians eat today like we do. Amen. Amen. Invite somebody over your house today and eat with them. Amen. That's what Jesus would do. Okay. So they're sitting at the table. 
Actually, it was before that they even happened. Uh, and Jesus is reclining and teaching and speaking. And there is Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his words. And Martha, of course, is busy in the kitchen, busy getting all the preparations ready, preparing the dinner. And, of course, she gets mad. Her sister is sitting at the feet of Jesus doing nothing. You know, Jesus, why don't you tell my sister to come help me? And now you know, you remember Jesus' words, right? Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things. But this one thing, one thing, Martha, you have not chosen to sit at my feet like Mary. And I'm not going to take away what Mary has been given right now. One thing mattered. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the voice of Jesus and following it. That's all that matters. So life gets so complicated and convoluted and all these preparation and all the things that have to happen. But only one thing matters. That we follow Jesus. We hear his voice and we follow him. Only one thing you lack. One thing is necessary. Hear the voice of God and follow. And when the rich young ruler, we really have to give him some credit to a certain degree. Look what Jesus is asking him to do. He's obviously very wealthy. People depend on him. He's got a large business. People are asking him to fulfill certain responsibilities. I would imagine most or if not all of his extended family works for him. And he provides for them. He's giving up his ancestral home, the farm. The farm he was probably born on, his father and grandfather were born on. Everything he, his sister, his brother, his father, his mother... His extended family have worked for. But this is precisely what following Jesus is. Forsaking all loyalties to money, to riches, to friends, to the esteem of the family. To put Jesus first in your life and follow him only. And that makes perfect sense why Jesus says this to the disciples. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children... For the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much as in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. This really is a remembrance of the story of Abraham. Remember that Abraham is, he's a pagan from the Ur of Chaldee. He's not a Jewish believer or follower of Judaism or uh, the one God, the one true God. None of that revelation has taken place really yet. And God calls Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldee to come to the promised land. And he picks up and takes everything that he has. Leaves his father's home. Leaves everything that he knew. His business, his wealth, all of his family's esteem and recognition. And he gets up and he leaves and he moves to the promised land. It's the same with us. We must leave all the loyalties behind To follow Jesus and him only. And we don't leave our families like they did in that day. And we shouldn't. If if somebody uses this as a doctrine or some type of justification to leave their families and go follow an evangelist or something like that, they're wrong. They're missing the point. Jesus is saying that you follow me first. That your loyalty is to me first. And that's what Jesus is teaching today. The standard of following Jesus is far too beyond the rich young ruler's ability to fulfill. His grief upon walking away from Jesus is not just rooted in his love for his wealth and his family, but it's in the acknowledgement that he cannot earn God's grace of eternal life. And status in God's eyes cannot be earned. It can only be received with gratitude. And Kenneth Bailey writes of this story, this beautiful language. With God there is no Pulling oneself up by the bootstraps. The self-confidence of the self-made person crashes and dissolves like a mighty wave on the sandy shore when eternal life is at issue. And seeing the grief of the rich young man, he walks away. And Jesus responds with this parable. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This parable is truly meant to be shocking. 
It is not meant as a door into a home. It is not meant as a city wall that has a small hole in it that the camel would have to bend down on his knees and shuffle through with people and supplies on its back. That is not what it's meant. It is meant to be interpreted literally. It is meant to be a tiny surgical needle and passing a camel through this massive needle. So in order to illustrate the shock and awe factor of this imagery, I'm going to need a camel and some supplies. And... Uh, I really need somebody tall, and since camels are really funny looking, uh, I know who we can use right here. Here's our camel, and because I went hiking this weekend and forgot to get a needle, I have a thumbtack. It will work just as well. (laughs) This could hurt. (laughs) William, will you help us, buddy? I need you to be the camel rider. Okay? (laughs) Come here, bud. You're not going to do it. Okay, I need another child. Come on, let's go. All right. Hop up on Mr. Randy's back. (laughs) Hold on. (laughs) We got a camel? You've got a needle? How did you come up with a needle? Wow. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I can see it. You know, you wet the head of a thread, you know what I mean? You want me to lick you or something like that? So you can... <clears throat> now, I need you to get about all the power and steam you can get. You're going to need it to get through this eye of the needle. Whenever you're ready... Go for it. (laughs) Now, does this look possible to you? But look at the eye of that needle. I mean, I can barely see through it. And I know you can't see through it, so. (laughs) Good job, guys. Thank you. Give my hand a. You see, what Jesus was saying by taking this literal parable was this. That the impossibility of taking this needle and passing a camel, the largest mammal that they had in that area at the time, and passing that camel through, that big, funny-looking camel, through the eye of a needle, is absolutely impossible. And what the rich young ruler was saying, what Jesus was saying to the rich young ruler was this getting into the kingdom of God by your own wealth or your performance or your ability or your, your riches is just as impossible as getting into the kingdom of God, like a camel going through the eye of a needle. It's not possible. It's only by God that it is possible. And the bystanders of the rich man's depressing moment are perplexed and they're unnerved at the thought that this rich man cannot get into the kingdom of heaven. And they're thinking, but wait, isn't it the rich who build churches and endow orphanages and give to the poor and fund missions? But what about us? We don't have any money like that. We can't do any of that. And how in the world can we be saved if the rich are doing the great things and we're doing nothing comparatively to that? But Jesus doesn't leave them in despair. And he says, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. See, salvation is an act of God, not of man. No person can enter the kingdom of God unaided by God. An inheritance is a gift not earned Rights, And all of your best efforts are futile. Even if you bankrupt yourself doing good, you still cannot meet the requirements to enter the kingdom of God. But Jesus is saying, I can meet them with for you. Just follow me. There's an old missionary story about a missionary in the Middle East. And it goes something like this, that there's this missionary who befriends this wonderful uh, kind of moral man, if you will, and he's a pearl diver. And he would dive down and he would find these beautiful pearls and bring them up and take them to market and make lots of money. And this pearl diver became good friends with the missionary. Of course, the missionary's one objective was to evangelize this pearl diver. And, you know, year after year, time after time of them communing together and and eating together and spending time together, the man just would not accept 
the doctrine of Jesus or of salvation. He couldn't get over the fact that it's just too easy. He says it's just too easy for, to enter the kingdom of God. I have to do something. I have to work for the kingdom of God. That works mentality. And so it came to the point that in their friendship, the pearl diver was getting older and he knew that uh, he wanted to make this one last pilgrimage to his holy land. And he said that to earn the salvation and enter into the kingdom of his God, that he would crawl on his knees thousands of miles to where his holy city was from his hometown. And he knew that it would so damage his body that it would be impossible for him to return, but he believed that he would enter into the kingdom of God and he would be blessed for it. And so the missionary is making this one last ditch effort, you know, please, please just receive Jesus and the gift of eternal life is yours. But the pearl diver invites him to his home one last time. This is his closest friend. His only family member in the whole land that is left. And the pearl diver brings the missionary to his home and he sets before the missionary at the table a little wooden box. And he opens up the wooden box And there is the largest and most beautiful pearl that the missionary has ever seen. He said, this is a perfect pearl. My son found this pearl. And he dove to the depths. He was the greatest in the land. He was the best pearl diver that there ever was. And my son dove down and he found this perfect, huge pearl. Who knows what it didn't go with at market. It was beyond all of cultured pearls. It was absolutely beautiful and captivating, worth thousands and thousands of dollars. And the diver pushes the box towards the missionary and says, I want you to have it. And he's thinking, oh my gosh, this is it. This is my opportunity to share and help him to understand what it means. The missionary begins to refuse immediately the gift of the beautiful pearl. He says, let me give you $10,000 for this pearl. It's too beautiful. I know I can take it to the market and sell it and make money. Just like this is, let me give you $10,000. He goes, no, 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 no. You don't understand. My son died finding this perfect pearl. He dove too deep and for too long and came up. And as he handed me the pearl, the narcosis set in and he died. He says, this pearl It's priceless to me. It cannot be given away. I mean, it cannot be bought. It can only be given. He says, you can't buy this pearl. I want to give it to you. And as the the diver began to say the words, all of a sudden, it made sense in his head. One son dying for the greatest gift anyone could ever give. He could not be bought. It could only be given. And he said, you know, for the last two years, I believed in the doctrine of Jesus. He said, but I could not understand why it could only be a gift and not something I could earn. And he said, but at that moment, I understood. And he received the Lord Jesus that day and received eternal life as a gift and not as something That he could purchase. And so Peter the Apostle pipes up. And unknowingly parallels the requirements of Jesus. Jesus said to the ruler. Sell everything that you have. And come follow me. And Peter says we have left everything that is ours. And have followed you. And Peter was saying that. They have left both people and property to follow Jesus. And it was only through the miracle of God's provision. That they were able to do it. The old obedience to the law was not to steal another man's property. But the new obedience to Jesus is is that your own property may have to be left behind to follow Jesus. The old obedience to leave your neighbor's wife alone. But the new obedience was is that you may have to leave your own wife alone to follow Jesus. It was the same with your father and mother. And Jesus is asking for a higher loyalty than all of the culture, than all of your property, than your wife or your children or your parents. And this was the shocking statement to the cultural norms. The last line returns us to the rich young ruler's desire from the beginning of eternal life. 
And he said to them, Truly I say to you that there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much in this time and in the age to come eternal life. And the rich young ruler could not receive eternal life because he could not earn it. Only God can achieve eternal life. And it's a work of God and not of man. It cannot be earned. It can only be received. Eternal life is not inherited through good works, but it's be received by those who allow God to work the impossible within them. Brother Andrew, if you could come and play. It's one last story that I think beautifully illustrates the point at hand. In the silver chair by C.S. Lewis, there's a young girl who's named Jill Pohl. And she's entered into the strange land of Narnia. Many of you know the Chronicles of Narnia with her friend Eustace Scrub. And due to her poor judgment, she finds herself alone and separated from Eustace. And she's very thirsty. And without water, she's walking all over the place looking for somewhere to go. And then all of a sudden she finds a beautiful stream, crystal clear, sparkling water. And she sees the stream and she thinks, finally, I feel like I'm going to die of thirst. Finally, I've found the water that I need. But she stops as she approaches the stream dead in her tracks. And there on the other side of the stream stands Aslan, the giant, the massive, the overwhelming lion the Jesus figure of the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. And there stands this massive lion and this little girl as she approaches the water. And she stops and she's, she's drawn to the lion, but at the same time she's fearful of what might happen if she approaches the stream. And as she gets closer, she thinks, this lion could devour me in one bite, but I'm so thirsty. And all of a sudden she hears this beautiful golden voice, come and drink. She looks around not knowing where the voice came from, and she hears it again, but this time she sees it coming from the lion's mouth. If you're thirsty, come and drink. She's absolutely afraid and unnerved at this point in time, but yet there's this deep sense of comfort and drawing towards the lion as she stands there before the stream. And she says, well, I'm afraid. I don't know that I can approach the stream. I think I'll find another one. And the lion says, there is no other stream. She says, well, why don't you go away? I'm afraid that you'll harm me or something like that. She says, would you promise that you wouldn't hurt me if I approached the stream? And the lion kind of groans and shakes his head and says, I will make no such promises. Finally, the little girl is so dehydrated and desperate for water. She keeps approaching the lion even though she is fearful of what might happen. As she approaches, the lion says, if you don't drink, you're going to die. Finally, she grows the nerve to come, to kneel before the stream and to take her hand and cup the water and bring it to her mouth and to drink. And it was the most satisfying drink she had ever had. It only took one drink to satisfy all of her thirst. And the lion's words ring true to us today. That there is only one stream. There's only one way. And without it, we are certain to find death. So with every eye closed, every head bowed, if you're thirsty and you're tired of trying to do it on your own, you're tired of the hardship of life and struggle after struggle after struggle, if it has to do with your salvation and that you don't know Jesus this morning, I want you to raise your hand. Lord, I need to know you. 
I need to know the living water streams that only you can give. The riches of your goodness and forgiveness. Just raise your hand. And if that's not you, that's okay. But if you're struggling with the fact that I've been trying to do this, I've been trying to make my life work, to make my family work, to make all the things in life happen and cohese together. But all of my efforts are futile and it's one problem after the next problem after the next problem and it feels like my life is falling apart. Then I want you to raise your hand. Say, that's me. And I'm going to remind you. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to remember you in prayer this morning. Anybody else? Thank you for those hands. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that there's only one way. And as we approach the streams of the grace of forgiveness this morning, Lord, we not only approach it as in trusting you that it's the only way that we can receive eternal life, but we trust you, Lord Jesus, that in our own futile attempts to live life like you would desire us to, Lord God, we need the streams of living water in our lives. Every attempt after every attempt falls to the ground. But Lord, I give it to you this morning. Would everybody pray that this morning? Lord, I give it to you this morning. I can't do it. It's impossible for me. But it's possible with you. Thank you for praying that prayer this morning. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity to kneel at the streams of the lion of our lives. To kneel at the stream of Avlon. To love you. To dedicate our lives to you. As we receive your gift of eternal life. To make the impossible possible. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So if the kids would come forward now, we got three prizes here.